Hey, everybody, and welcome to a fatherly wild ride with Steve-O. My dad is just a star. There's no other way to slice it. The first episode we did with him way back was just so heartwarming and wonderful. And this time around, a lot has changed. Dad is just kind of bashing me a lot, but... He's also now on my payroll. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy the way that, that life works, man. And uh, boy, is this full circle and I, I think really inspiring, man. Plus, it, it, I almost cry on this one. So uh, it's a big deal. Let's get into it. How do I, how, where do I position this so I'm Fist not... Fist away from your mouth. Okay, and, and that, that looks good. That looks good. Yeah, that looks really good. You look really comfortable. That's your camera. This is oh, my, that's my camera. Oh, that's my camera. So I'm over. Okay. Yeah, we, had, we used green for you last time. I'm not mad at the idea of sticking with green. I don't see any. You remember green. that? Oh, there you go. There you go. How do yeah, you remember I, that? I, I, I well, remember. I, I remember <laughs> with the other RV, uh, a sense of hypocrisy, because Steve was such a animal lover. And it bothered him when he couldn't get a car. He, he got a car, but it was leatherette seats, and people would think that it was real leather, and that offended his sense of no, no, protecting it was the real animal. Leather seats. And this is just fake fur. Right. But, but, but to me, it's, it's disrespectful of the animals. Um, <laughs> I was offended by the seats being leather, and I cut out the leather. Yeah, I know you did, but then it bothered you that people thought that you had the leather because the fake leather was so realistic. This is so obviously fake leather. Ladies and gentlemen, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> this is great right here. Yeah, Dad episode part two, the second appearance. Now we're on the tour bus. What do you think of the tour bus? Uh, it's interesting. You call it? I call it Gigi. Yeah. Uh, and I call it that I think before you'd even closed the purchase. Correct. Uh, Gigi standing not for a sexy woman, but for gas guzzler. Yeah. <laughs> I think you kind of discovered that, and it's worth it to you. I'm not suggesting that you either can't or shouldn't afford it, but it's just a feature that is important to anybody who might consider getting one of these things. Well, the dynamics of my tour, being a theater tour with each night representing a different city, really precludes airplane travel. That's so we were either going to rent a bus or buy a bus. I agree with that. And and you've done well in the theaters. And uh, the theaters generally, I guess, are easier for finding parking. Uh, <laughs> that's true, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, plus I don't have to worry about it because we've got a bus driver. Well, that's a plus as well. Yeah. So so you're on the bus. It's It's comfy. It's, it, it's got a lot of recording shit all over the place and, you know, crap food, and, and uh, but it's nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's nice. It's nice. And um, when you refer to my closing the deal on the, the RV tour bus, yeah. you know all about that because you're so intimately looped into my, uh, my business and... Uh, the the affairs of my business absolutely and, and it was to me i guess it was a chicken and an egg you couldn't do the theater tour without the bus but if the theater tour didn't work you're taking on a lot of overhead that might be difficult to justify and you brought it together you know the timing was not only good but you managed it and it's turned out to be highly successful i i am not being critical of you having the tour bus, but it does. I, I'm just haunted by the animals that are represented. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Um, now, since the last time that you were on the hit Wild Ride with Steve-O podcast, you've become a formal member of my team, not just a supportive dad, but it started with uh, the, 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 the restructuring of my business management. You right. helped with that. And you, you came on my team in a formal paid capacity. Right. Then it expanded to you being in charge of my uh, insurance needs. Yes. Because insurance is, is uh, an Achilles heel for me. Right. And then it expanded even further to, uh, to, to I would say, a, a human resource capacity. And don't forget the legal. The legal, right. <laughs> so uh, so it's, it's pretty crazy to me, like, just to, to imagine if, if 
20 years ago, 30 years ago, if you, if you said to a young Steve-O, hey, you know what? It's actually going to work out for you. You're actually going to achieve um, an, an international level of uh, exposure and, 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 and you're going to have a successful career and your dad is going to be on your payroll. Like that would, that'd be too much. And here we are, and that's what, it's great. I guess the thing that's surprising to me is that um, not all, but uh, virtually all of my business experience came with large corporations. And it's fascinating to me how the disciplines, the learning experiences, and the practices can translate across different businesses. You're a relatively small business, by corporate standards, very small, but within the entertainment business, even relatively small. Uh, you're notably undisciplined much of the time. Um, and, and yet it works because translating the principles that large companies follow into simplified programs that can be effectively implemented in smaller companies uh, is really incredible. And I had one experience, I was doing some independent consulting for a golf course, golf course developer in Vero Beach. And the assignment was, you know, bringing to his development uh, managers, you know, large company uh, structures and disciplines. Uh -huh. now, like job descriptions, like financial reporting, like strategies, like all, all this kind of stuff that we're now talking about. And it literally does translate. Yeah. And when you say I'm undisciplined much of the time, I think I'm actually really quite consistent in being very disciplined in distinct areas there's and a, very undisciplined in other areas all the time. Th there, there's, a fi <laughs> there's, there's a fine line between self-discipline and compulsiveness. Okay, I, I compulsiveness. You, 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 you are fantastic when you're interested in something, right? But frequently, uh, far more important things that you're not interested in kind of fall by the boards, right? And that's been a problem. Right? We might as well come, you know, be candid and 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 talk about what I describe as an intervention, which you and Scott <laughs> Randolph over here. How, how many interventions have we had? I mean, there was one that really stuck out. When I came out to California in, in this past couple of months, I thought that was kind of a big one. That was an intervention for uh, the big picture of my business sort of, you know, world. Which Whereas, one are you talking about? I'm talking about the phone call where dad said, hey, you know, it's really demoralizing to work extremely hard on putting something together for you and then present it, all of our work to you in an email which doesn't even get opened. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and that really, that really stung, you know, that really stung and, and um, and it's tough, I, I really do. And I think that as undisciplined as I am when I'm not you know, on fire for something, the one saving grace is that I've managed to surround myself with a team of people who fill in my gaps. You have. And um, I, honestly, I'm proud to be a part of that. I, I love it, I love, I, I, I'm so proud of having you on my team. I'm so grateful for having you on my team and you you genuinely help my team so much. But there you know there, there is a hidden agenda that I feel very strongly about. And I've told you this before, but for the benefit of the uh, you know, the camera. Um, there are a small minority of, of entrepreneurs become successful. But in absolute numbers, there are a lot of successful, very wealthy people. And the small businesses grow. And typically, a business reaches a certain size where it becomes too big for the entrepreneur to be able to manage it within his comfort system. Uh, one exit strategy is to sell out to uh, you know, a larger business and take a bunch of millions of dollars and fade right off, off into, into the, into sunset. the sunset. The other is to be a compulsive control freak 
and insist on running it yourself until you run it into the ground and you don't have any millions of dollars. Uh, in your case, you don't have the option to sell because your business, business is your brand, you are the business. And so it's important to me to get you to a point where you can manage, you can fulfill the role of a professional manager. I'm not gonna be around forever. I'm almost Oof. 80 years old. Uh, I, it's a race against time to get you competent before I'm no longer in the picture. Man, is that tough to swallow. <laughs> to swallow, it's tough to hear. Um, and uh, I think it, it makes for a good time to mention how universally, as I understand it, universally well received the first podcast that you and I recorded together, how moving and, and, and just beautiful it was, you know, to, to be able to express my gratitude for our relationship. But I didn't get as many hits as Tony Hawk that week. No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure, but it, 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 it ranks among the more popular ones. Great. You're, you're, a, you're a top tier guest. Fantastic. Right. And, um, and, and I don't think that we need to drag everybody through the minutia of my, my business world, but um, strides are being made for me to become more competent of a manager, and boy, is there a long way to go. But they've come a long way, too. Yeah. The glass is half full, it's not half empty. Right. Well, well part, of the, part of the argument for me is like, how, how many days in a row have you meditated? I have meditated for uh, 1,100 and some days in a row. 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes at night. Typically, I do 25 minutes in the morning and 16 minutes at night. Your <laughs> life your life would change, your business life would change significantly if you just looked at your emails five minutes in the morning. That would probably solve every problem that you ever have. You think he could solve a problem of that magnitude in just five minutes? <laughs> I, I, I mean, how, uh, how, many, how many emails are you, do you think you're behind now? Oof. Because the last intervention, he was like five or six hundred, and then he swore you'd never do it again. I didn't been... swear I would never do it again. I swore that I would get better at it, and I did get better at it. And recognizing that the problem is not going to be entirely fixed, <laughs> I think that what we have adapted to is a system by which we alert me to really important stuff that needs immediate attention recognizing that I'm never going to be on top of all of the emails well, and when we do alert me to something important that needs immediate attention my track record is pretty good for giving that immediate attention 88 percent I would say all right well that's better than it was before the intervention <laughs> that's that's what you call recovery <laughs> on track I'm, 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 I'm trying to figure out uh, if you're aware that something is important uh, obviously you're gonna give it attention you rely uh, um, very heavily I think in Scott and Isaac to identify for you what you should be paying attention to and it may be a while before they get you to answer the phone or talk to them about it there's a time lag there that I think still is a problem and and it is becoming a, a uh, <laughs> smaller problem. Small, yeah. Progress, man. We're making big progress. <laughs> right. We're 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 on the right track. And as some of my bosses said, progress is important up to a point, but if that's all you got, you're gonna get your ass fired. What was the thing about the newspaper? I remember you telling me something about there was like five executives in there and you'd leave four newspapers oh yeah 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 this this uh we had uh i guess there was a team i had five guys that reported to me and the office was in a big old house we got a lease on it and uh subdivided the larger rooms into cubicles there were probably uh 60 people more or less that occupied it and uh, we had complimentary uh, uh copies of the local newspaper but I forget whether it was by accident or event certainly eventually it was by design. There was one fewer newspaper than the number of people who were entitled to pick it up on the way into the office. And it reached a point where kind of guys were walking around with the newspaper under their arm and <laughs> whoever didn't have it <laughs> kind of felt sensitive. And it was a, a, a hidden motivation yeah, to, to get, get the to rest. To work on time. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's wild. Wow. 
So, so if you didn't have the newspaper under your arm, you were a flaky late loser. Uh, that's a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, there was a uh, an hour or two of sensitivity and embarrassment. Uh, but there, there are a lot of very good, competent people that can't get their ass out of bed in the morning, and you're one of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Scott is very, very uh, prejudiced against anybody who doesn't show up exactly on time. Well, yeah. and, and what Dad just said is that there are certain people who, even if they might show up a few minutes late, are, uh, are you know, valuable enough that you got to overlook that. But... And more in the larger corporations than ah, even in entre entrepreneurial things. The, uh, it's like your credibility is like savings in a bank. Right. And if you spend your money stupidly, you're going to have less savings and not as much to show for. Right. If you waste your credibility on trivial things, you're a net, it's a net loss no matter how you define it. Right. When we started working together, you, you were up by nine and your bed was made. Every day, except um, on the road when we were doing late shows, but that that was your thing. Yeah, that that is that was something that um, continued after uh, my uh, living in a halfway house, where that was the rule. Yeah, and um, I, I I don't want to say that that institutionalized. I mean, I don't know. I, I uh, if, if I sleep to a certain point then I start feeling like okay now I'm starting to feel like a loser but then that doesn't happen at 9 a.m. anymore <laughs> well I feel like it's crazy like 10, 10 I, I, I generally I'm getting up but 10 is my my norm these days when 10, you start when you 11. started to become a little bit successful in the tour and you had the merch sales developing you frequently had to stay up until one or two in the morning to handle the merch after the second show. Right. And my sense is that's when it kind of fell off a cliff because it gave you a, a legitimate excuse to uh, sleep in in the morning. I mean, when I'm on tour, then forget about the morning. You know what gets me out of bed every time? is a UFC pay-per-view event. And this weekend, UFC 284 going down in Perth, Australia. We got Makachev and Volkanovski, possible double champ status on the line. Two title fights. It's so much fun. I love the UFC. And it couldn't be a more fun time to bet on the UFC. And if you're planning to anyway, then DraftKings Sportsbook is the way to go. Because... If you go and download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use the promo code Stevo, a mere bet of five dollars on a UFC 284 will instantly get you two hundred dollars in bonus bets. I don't know how they're giving away a deal like that, but I'll tell you who they're giving it to: the listeners of the Wild Ride podcasts. So if you're thinking about Gambling on UFC 284. Man, did I just give you the way to do it. Download DraftKings Sportsbook app and use the promo code Stevo. $5 bet gets you $200 in bonus bets. Of course, minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. And let's get back to it. And I think we might have covered this when we spoke to you on the podcast last time, that by going into business, that you are kind of a black sheep in your family. I wouldn't put it that way. I mean, I, my family are, you know, all academics. Uh, academics, theologians, zoologists. My grandfather wrote a number of theological books that were acclaimed at the time. And, and that's impressive. Uh, very, is there anybody on your side of the family who isn't at least a, a PhD or the equivalent? I, I guess, you know, I, my, 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 my cousin on my mother's side of the family is very much like me. You know, an undergraduate degree and a business background. and a, Clyde White. A sim, yeah, a similar range of interests. Clyde White, and that's your cousin on the mother's side of the family yes. who broke my jaw. <laughs> <laughs> when when I was ten years old, maybe eleven years old, and 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 I was going to baseball camp every every summer. I was a fanatic about baseball, and and we were at 
Clyde White's house and and uh, Clyde White's pitching the baseball to me and I'm just roping it all over and dad's the, the fielding it. Dad gets <laughs> sick and tired of running around after this ball to get it back to Clyde to pitch it to me again. So he says, Clyde, burn it in faster. He wants to make it more difficult for me to hit the ball everywhere. And Clyde, who very much looks up to dad, <clears throat> Burns it in faster. Burns it in so fast it hits me right in the jaw and 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 breaks my jaw. And and so we know that there's a problem here. But I but Dad's putting me on an airplane <laughs> to fly by myself from Boston to London, England. And before Dad being ever the responsible dad, he says, "Before I put you on this flight by yourself, you're gonna eat a hamburger." <laughs> he made me eat a hamburger, and I'm like, "Dad." It hurts. <laughs> Shut up and eat it. <laughs> I, I I think I offered it and you politely uh, declined and you suffered the pangs of hunger in the long flight to London. Nah, I think you made me eat it. <laughs> but it's fun. It's fun and it's funny. And uh, yeah, you're you're right that your cousin is uh, very much a successful businessman. Correct. Um, and, 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 and the other thing that's kind of interesting um, you had a one of the distinctive features of your childhood was that when we moved back to London, you were age ten. Nine. Uh, n- nine. About was it nine? Nineteen. Yeah, I turned ten in fourth grade. Okay, okay, fair enough. Uh, almost not, almost ten. And I remember getting a phone call from the mother of one of your classmates. Uh, they were inviting you to go and do a, an overnight with them one weekend, and she called up to find out if we minded you traveling on the London Underground. And their son, who was also about 10, uh, and they'd lived there for a while, was streetwise and, and allowed to travel in the Underground. So I talked to your mom and said, well, if that's the way it works, you know, he's getting an early start, but that's going to be good. And, and in no time at all, you were traveling independently <coughs> all over London using the underground system to go wherever the hell you wanted to go. By myself at the age of 10. Yeah. And there are a lot of people, I guess, that might call that irresponsible parenting. But the flip side of that argument is that every kid inevitably comes to a point of vulnerability, of risk. And kids that have grown up in American suburbs and never been able to go anywhere unless driven by their parents. And then the big thing is to get their driver's license, but you know, <clears throat> it's just a very, very different world. Right. And then they get out, you know, you know, into college or work or whatever it is, and you know, they got drugs all over the place and all kinds of shit going on. And they get hit all at once, a tsunami wave of temptations and risk. And I like to think that by spreading that risk over your life <laughs> you, it was incremental and well, you got you, you you gained you know experience you became street smart and i think that was kind of maybe a risky investment but one that paid off sure i had all of the freedom at the age of 10 that the average american kid doesn't enjoy until they turn 16 and and have access to a car no not even close you know, the average American doesn't get close to your freedom until uh, at age 10 until they're away at college and removed from parental supervision and any kind of curfew right. control. And despite that being introduced to independence at such a young age, man, did I do a tsunami of drugs and alcohol <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I got to college. <laughs> well, hey, you know, all's well that ends well. Right. I, I, I agree. Um, and yeah, you, you had that disposition. I mean, yeah. it didn't matter whether you were riding the London tube at 10 or whether you were a freshman in college at 18. Right. You know, the drugs and booze and everything was going to come your way no matter what. For sure. For sure. No, no, no question about that. Um, now, I, I wonder... Um, you know, like I, I told you that I think it's really interesting how you come from this this uh, this line of academics with with the emphasis on theology and and uh, clergymen. I mean, what's the 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 clergy influence in your family tree? 
Oh. Clergy being somebody who's a priest or a, some a, a, a church official. Uh, maybe a great uncle in England that I hardly knew. My grandfather uh, wrote theological books and occasionally was a guest preacher. But nobody in my family that I'm aware of, uh, at least that I knew at, during my life, was ever a full-time preacher. Uh, okay, then then uh, I, I'm glad that we cleared that up. <laughs> um, you, when you were I want like uh, maybe 25 years old before you met mom, uh, uh, younger. Uh, when when did I? Um, I'm just trying. Yeah, it's about right. And and uh, what was it? Uh, the the um, famous televangelist you got in. Some... Oh, this was before I met your mother. Um, a very good friend of mine that is, I'm still close to him, um, Peter Nichols, we went to nursery school together. Oh, way back. Uh, wow. he's the one who we <laughs> met. He, he, he was taking his, uh, he was at Univers University of British Columbia. Uh, I think he was in his master's program then, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. And uh, I hung out with him, and uh, his girlfriend had a girl I was introduced to, and she seemed kind of interesting. and. Um, Somehow, I got invited to a, uh, a Sunday luncheon at her uncle's house. And this was a guy I could instantly respect. At the time, he was in his uh, middle 40s, I guess, uh, visibly successful both in his business and in his lifestyle. And the first indication I ever had that it was possible both to be relatively wealthy and successful in business and also to be a Christian. I mean, now you know there are many examples, but in those days I thought if you're going to be a Christian you had to be poor. <laughs> and I didn't want to be poor. <laughs> so anyway, this guy, you know, Jack Oliver, uh, was an influence. And you know, his, his uh, uh, niece included me in that Sunday luncheon. And by coincidence, the following week, the Billy Graham crusade was coming to Vancouver. And this was the main topic of conversation. The family were all totally involved in the organization and the committees and that kind of thing. And I was living in this boarding house. I mean, it was probably better than what you'd think of a boarding house being today, but I had a modest room and a modest house. And uh, there were several other guys that were paying weekly rents to live there. And I was kind of curious about um, you know, this whole Billy Graham thing. And my roommate, uh, who was from Chilliwack, British Columbia, and, you know, not too worldly a guy, but a nice guy, I said, hey, why don't we go to the Billy Graham's crusade and find out what it's all about? And so we went, and the music, and uh, the fantastic show. So you got sucked into it. And I, 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 I was, I mean, people say that I'm not emotional. And... <laughs> But I kind of got a little bit emotional. Okay. And, and, and so we went forward. And what I suddenly realized was that standing behind me was my host, the uncle of... And this lady could never be called a girlfriend because they belonged to the Plymouth Brethren sect. And any uh, lechery in my mind was a pipe dream. I mean, this was, uh, it took me not very long to figure that out. But by then I was kind of, you know, okay. in, in, I like the Sunday lunches. But, uh, you know, he was standing behind me. And, and the, the way these things work, you know, members of the local Christian community volunteer to... Uh, you know, sort of be a sponsor, Same, right. similar to AA. So what, so what we're getting to is that for a, a somewhat brief, or how, how long were you into the Christian thing? Well, I, I had rejected it in high school because I was forced to go to church and I just looked around and saw a bunch of hypocrites. So I'd rejected it. But this was kind of a new thing. And I got into it. I had about two and a half months, three months left uh, in Vancouver, and I went to the Plymouth Brethren Assembly every Sunday, and you know I went to Bible study and all this kind of stuff, and I went back to Toronto, and uh, you know I, I met your mother, and you know she had an Anglican upbringing, but she wasn't too terribly devout, and it kind of gradually receded. So I, this was uh, a pretty brief stint. Yeah, but, but as an extreme case, uh, for a while I lived in a 
a, a rundown, shitty big house uh, where we had about six or eight of us that paid the rent. And every weekend there'd be guys sleeping on the floor that had stopped in for the football game or something. And I remember one Sunday morning, this buddy of mine was absolutely passed out from, from the night before. And he's asleep on the living room floor. And I said, hey, Rich, Rich, do you want to come to church with me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And, and, and we, that, that, that didn't go anywhere. But I, I decided in, within six months that that was not the life I wanted for the rest of my life. But having had that experience. I, I, I had the monkey on my back. I had this fear of eternal damnation and all the stuff that the, uh, you know, the evangelist, evangelist uh, put out. And I, then my business side kicked in. And I said, you know, if this world is finite, and by doing what I want to do, I'm screwing myself for eternity, that doesn't sound like a good strategy. So then I said, I've got to, you know, figure out, you know, a factual basis so I don't feel vulnerable for uh, giving up on it. And that started probably uh, oh, 35 or 40 years not of intensive study, but reading a lot of different books uh, on various aspects of Christianity uh, to find what I thought were enough loopholes that I didn't have to worry about hell and damnation. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You just can't argue with my dad's approach. If you're worried about something, educate yourself with the facts. That is why I wear a whoop strap. I don't want to worry about my health, so I make sure I know the facts about my health, starting with how much I'm sleeping, how much time I'm spending in each stage of sleep, how much recovery am I getting for the activity I had the day before, what activities am I doing, how many calories am I burning. I'm telling you, this whoop band is so sophisticated, it now tells me how oxygenated my blood is. I mean, dude, skin temperature, respiratory levels. I mean, there are more insights into your health than you can get from any other fitness device, period. You want to know what's going on with your body? Then wear whoop like me and all kinds of people who know what's going down. And if you go to whoop dot com and use the promo code stevo you get 15 percent off at checkout plus that's with whoop 4.0 which is the new one that has the waterproof charger you never have to take the band off man you just slide on your waterproof charger boom you're good to go 15% off at checkout is a pretty killer deal too because the membership like Boom. Just got a lot more affordable. And the Whoop band itself is free with the membership. So what are you waiting for? Go to Whoop.com and use the promo code Stevo and get the facts about your health. Now let's get back to it. And in doing that, you developed a relationship with a pastor at the local church in England. Yes. And he guided you through uh, the the literal uh, original scriptures that became the Bible and the actual uh, translation from Aramaic and Greek? Yes. Uh, guided is a big word. <clears throat> he claimed that he could read classical Greek, and I had no uh, foundation for either believing or disbelieving that. But the thing that always bothered me, among the things that bothered me the most, this, uh, I think it's either chapter 14, verse 6 in the book of John, or 614, I forget the sequence. But the saying, uh, there is no way to, to my, my father, father but except through me. Through me. Right. And you see these people holding signs at football games on TV that quote John 314. Three, yeah, whatever it is. And uh, uh, I said, Gary, help me with that. I mean, uh, how is it possible that a genuinely good religion could condemn genuinely good people to damnation simply because they believe in a different religion? Right, and, and to, to put into perspective here, 
what you had done in isolating this one translated line which says from the bible and the english translation is the only way to my father is, thr is through me yes and that and it's that one line and only that one line upon which this whole idea that that you have to accept jesus christ as your savior to go well, to heaven is based uh i'm sure there's a lot more to it than that that that's the flagship line that's the flagship that, line. That, 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 that's the flagship line. And Gary said to me, well, think about this for a second. What if I gave you an alternative translation from the original manuscripts, which was an equally valid translation? And that translation uh, would be, you know, Christ speaking, now that I have come to this earth and shared my teachings, it will be easier for more people to find God. And the light flashed on it. I said, son of a bitch. I mean, is that really an equally valid translation? And he said, yes. And then you've got to look at the history of the New Testament. There have been more than 100 different English translations you know, from the original manuscripts and in many different languages. Uh, it was first put together uh, at the Nicene, Con um, Nicene Council. Council in 325 under... Con, uh, Consta uh, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, yep. and uh, you know they collected all of the senior members of the then, I guess it was a Catholic church, but it wasn't referred to as Catholics, <clears throat> to pull together what the New Testament would be. And they all went through, you know, there are many, many manuscripts and books and uh, competing entries. And obviously, they all had an axe to grind. You know, they right. wanted the power. They, they wanted, wanted to consolidate and, and, power. And so they chose selectively what books would be included and what would be excluded. And then over time, uh, as each subsequent translation or edition was produced, you know, the people that had the self-interest, the axe to grind, were coming up with the translations that would best serve their purpose. And so. The other piece that came together, that was one piece that was important. <clears throat> the other thing I got interested in, Flavius Josephus was a famous historian at that time in, in early Palestine at the time of Christ. And he uh, you know, led a, uh, uh, an uprising against Rome. He was captured. Uh, he went back, he was taken back to Rome, he befriended the emperor, and he returned to Palestine with the mission of trying to get the Jews to accept more peacefully the um, Roman rule. He became the most famous historian of that era. I don't have the credentials to validate that, but he, you look him up on... Uh, Is this the, the manuscript that he wrote, which, which only mentions Christ one time in like 500 pages? No, 900 pages. <laughs> it's like a small paragraph. <laughs> yeah, 900 pages. And, 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 and there was this one little section on one page. And I said, okay, I mean, yeah, okay, that's possibly extreme. But if all of this shit was going on that is the foundation of the modern religion, and if the evangelical theory of history was accurate, why would Josephus have so completely ignored it? Right. And now, when, is, that, when, is, that, is that absolutely compelling, decisive uh, condemnation? No. But it's another source of questions that starts you thinking about the history of the time. And uh, Right. And, and yeah, that, 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 that bothered me. And then uh, the uh, Catholic, uh, which I guess is universally Christian, but the theory of original sin. And the theory that everybody is a sinner at birth, and uh, the only way they can stop being a sinner and... Well, the only way they can be saved... Saved is by you know, accepting Christ. And there was one author, uh, Burton Mack, he was a theologian at the uh, uh, University of Washington. And he was, uh, you know, a, a skeptic of Christianity. And one of the things I'll never forget, his theory, was that at that time, the religion of the area was Orthodox Judaism. And Orthodox Judaism had an incredible litany of rules. I mean, from not eating shellfish, you got to do this. Right. I mean, it was unbelievable. And uh, 
the simple Christian doctrine, Christ embraced the Ten Commandments and basically said, if you live the Ten Commandments, you'll have a better life and you'll be a better human being. And Burton Mack's theory was that by Christ establishing the Ten Commandments as the rule of the religion, all of this shit in the Orthodox Judaism of, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that, you must do this, you can't do that, all that kind of stuff went by the boards. Be right. and, and, so, and so in accepting Christ, it wasn't that that's the only way of uh, being saved, but it's the way that people could escape from this incredible long list of rules that they could never uh, obey. Right. And since failure to obey all of them meant you were a sinner, when you didn't have to obey them all, you weren't a sinner. Right. And I think uh, in the, in the, the uh, subject of translation, I think that it's actually commandments, isn't it? I think uh, it's more ten suggestions. Uh, I, I I never got to that point. I'm not going to go take either side of that. Okay. Uh, maybe, I mean, the, the, maybe, maybe basically, I won't the Ten Commandments <laughs> are essentially similar in, in Judaism and Islam as well as Christianity. You know, whether Moses brought them down from the mountain and the tablets, I'm not qualified to say, but they're universally recognized as a key to a better life. Right. And, and man, it, wouldn't it be great if, if all of the various religions were just on the same page? Yeah. They could all equally <laughs> be, you know, that, that's why the, the church that, that I go to from time to time called the Self-Realization Fellowship is uh, considered a church of all religions. Their opening prayer is, uh, uh, you know, beloved God, you know, uh, father, mother, you know, saints of all religions, we bow to you all, yeah, recognizing but, <laughs> every religion as an equally viable path yes, to yes. heaven. But let me for a second take the flip side of that. You know, I can't prove this statistically, but I have a bias that if you had demographically matched samples of sincere Christians in one room, and atheists or agnostics in the other room, and there was some way of measuring their happiness in life, I would be willing to bet that the Christian group would be more happy than the non-Christian group. I, I don't disagree with that. And, 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 and yet, you know, if you get into the situation that I was in, uh, where I felt trapped by the extremists uh, you know, in the Christian faction, and had the motivation to do the reading that I did. Now I came up with a, uh, 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 I guess, an understanding, a limited, not a theological or a uh, really academic understanding, but a practical understanding. A spiritual <clears throat> position, a position on yeah. spirituality. And, and the other thing, I remember talking to a, a devout Christian at the golf club one day, and, and uh, I forget how it came up. It was maybe the... Uh, we we're talking about anti-Semitism. It was maybe one of the Jewish holidays, and um, you know, he uh, said that anti-Semitism was either founded, based, influenced by the belief that the Jews killed Christ. I turned to him and said, "Ron, that's bullshit. Christ chose to die. He could have avoided the crucifixion." But he chose to die because it was important to fulfill the prophecies in the scriptures. And that's why, you know, on, you know, he... he, he it wasn't Christ also a Jew? So to say that the Jews killed him might be a little bit weird. Well, no, but the, 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 the uh, Jewish establishment wanted to get rid of him because he was undermining their control of their population. His teaching went directly against the teaching of Orthodox Judaism. Right, with all the rules. With all the rules and the power. I mean, again, religion, a lot of, distinguish between honest religion and organized religion. Organized religion is a lot about power. And there's not a whole lot of difference between the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. You know, you know the hierarchy wants to gain, build, and keep power. Right. Well, I also read that like in the 14 or 1500s, 
Revelations wasn't even in the Bible at the time. And so that they had two versions of Revelations. One was a positive version, one was a negative version, like damnation and hell, because the church was hurting and they needed to get people in there to donate 10% of their, like, their tithing. Uh -huh. And so they decided to put the, the negative version in there. And that's where like, you know, the, the, the horsemen of the apocalypse. And if you don't, uh, you know, yeah. whatever. So, so they chose that version to get people scared to go to church in order to make more money. I'm not aware of that specific, but it honestly, checks out. but, but the, the logic ties in with uh, a lot like, of other logic. Yeah. Right. I, I listened to a lot of, uh, Bart Ehrman. He's a uh, biblical scholar of the new Testament uh -huh. and he debates people all the time on that. And he was a Christian, same thing, but he, uh, he talks about, you know, the fact that Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, they don't even, they can't even confirm that it was written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John because the person that was writing it never even said his own name. And so they said what a lot of people did in that time is they would, um, it was like a battle to get, like not published, but you know, the, your papyrus to, to, to circulate throughout the community. And what they think is that, you know, the first, I, I forget which, which book was first, but it was written like 90 years after Christ lived. So it was like, rec even recalling these events or what he said, it'd be like trying to yeah. remember verbatim like Truman's speech yeah. on TV. It'd be impossible. And furthermore, they said that there's more changes to the New Testament than there are words. So, I, I would believe that because, yeah. because there have been so many different interpretations and uh -huh. translations um, and everyone who came up with their own version had a personal axe to grind. Right. And how many how the, many people, you know, have a deep enough knowledge of classical Greek and Arama Aramaic yeah. to get into a serious debate with a theologian about the translations he's chosen to put out? Well, right. even in even the word for hell was different. Like it didn't mean a fiery place. It just meant like like if you if you if you, if you, you might be unhappy if you don't. You're, you have a well, burning in your stomach. Like you yeah. know, like anxiety or like uh, uh, just sin. The the I think the original translation for sin was just like missing the mark. Yeah, but you you go to uh, you know all the churches and art galleries in Europe. You know all the paintings show people dying in hell and arrows in the right. Yeah, but still, that's not till like the fifteen hundreds. That's true. But but so so I was raised Catholic and like I saw that in my church and I'm like sitting here thinking like as a seven eight nine year old kid I'm looking at. Uh, you know, St. Felicitas Perpetua getting beheaded, or like what kind of abuse is that where you're looking at these pictures or like, they're saying like, well, if you know, I, I was always taught that like my dad was going to hell because he wasn't a Catholic. And so it's like, I, I'm being told by nuns that my dad's going to hell. I'm like, wait yeah. a minute, like, that's gnarly to say this to some child, you know? Have right. you ever thought about what hell is? I, 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 you know, I have a philosophy. All, all of these paintings in the art galleries, you know, pure bullshit because they know that the body, you know, disintegrates, is cremated. The body does not survive. So what survives is the spirit. And now you've got uh, these haunted castles in Europe, you know, these places where supposedly the spirits roam around and they're unhappy. My theory is that there is a spiritual afterlife. And if you have uh, feel guilt about sins that you committed while you were living, uh, that you never dealt with, made amends for, uh, took care of, it's perfectly believable to me that this in the spiritual afterlife, You'll the spirit would be you. haunted by that. Mm. And you know, when you say rest in peace, presumably that means you know spirits which are not haunted by it. But the uh, criterion there isn't what the Catholic Church or any other organized religion says you should do. It's what you feel good or bad about yourself in terms of the life that you lived and whether or not you took advantage of opportunities to make amends. Life I like, review. I, I, I like a life review big time, and, and I love that a lot. Um, I think that it, it's... Uh, a very constructive approach that you took to get that monkey off your back. I'm glad that you did get the monkey off your back. And I also agree that uh, people with people of faith are happier people. I agree That's with true. that. That's true. And 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 uh, obviously, 
they're not happier people if they have faith which is going back now a number of years deemed to be uh, uh, um, in insufficient I right. mean, there's an awful lot of serious persecution of people who were genuinely religious. Uh, that's less of an issue now than right. it was, but in some countries, that's still an issue. Right. But uh, I, I'm glad that that, uh, that that we discussed that, and and, and I'm glad that you um, you wrote uh, what did you call it? My uh, my belief on spirituality, and you wrote it as a letter to me, my sister Cindy, and uh, any future uh, grandchildren alike. I read it. I read it in New Zealand, and I and, and I, I, I I didn't stop reading it until I got to the part where you mentioned. Um, the, your wedding date with Steve's mom and it was the same exact date as I was reading it and I just was like and I stopped and I put it down it was just Sorry, so my what, what, what? Well, you, you mentioned the date in there yeah it was whenever you you married uh, uh, yeah November 10th no, December 18th when it, yeah and, and I was literally reading it on December 18th and I was like Oh my God, this is crazy. <laughs> and I never picked it back up after those words. But that, 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 that would, in many circles, be termed uninformed superstition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but but uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, a, a wonderful thing that you wrote, and it's um, testimony it, that you're a, a good guy who believes in living a good life, and that you're a very educated guy who's put a great deal of effort into... In, into n knowing things knowledge is power and that's something that you've taught me hey, you know what else is power money dude and the best way to be making money these days is with an e-commerce operation you build the audience online and then you sell to the audience online with ship station that's how i'm telling you to buy stevo's butt wipes for your butthole I mean, there's no toilet that's not going to look cooler and be more fun to sit on if it's got Stevo's butt wipes for your butthole sitting on top of it. And how do I sell these, okay? Well, down in my warehouse in San Diego, we use ShipStation, meaning that when somebody places an order for my butt wipes, uh, it prints out a label, right? And... Boom, they slap the label on the thing and it automatically has the lowest prices available from all of your different carriers like UPS, the United States Postal Service, FedEx. Rates that are normally reserved for Fortune 500 companies are yours with ShipStation. It's epic and <clears throat> the labels come out, they get slapped on, they're, they're out the door <clears throat> and dude, it all happens so quickly and so easily plus ShipStation is one interface. So if you're selling from your own website or if you're using Amazon or Etsy, it's all built into one interface that makes it so easy to use. The labels come out, they go on the package. Dude, you are making money and money is power. So to get a 60-day free trial with ShipStation, you go to ShipStation.com and use the promo code Stevo. And you're off to the races with two months of hassle-free shipping, the best rates going. And I mean, dude, what do you got to lose? Everything. If you're not killing it with your own e-commerce business, you are losing everything. So get to ShipStation.com, use the promo code Stevo, and enjoy. Enjoy your power. Now let's get back to it. So let, let, let's... Uh, I, I got a question. Okay. I'm gonna, this is a good segue, and I think we talked about bringing this up, so I'm not springing it on you. Um, the uh, Animal Sanctuary in Florida... Right. Ooh. I, 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 I'm dying to know, it, it, the, the case to have the animal sanctuary in Florida is a lot better than having it in Vancouver. Of course it is. Vancouver is not a place for an animal sanctuary. So where would you want an animal, where would you advise Steve to have an animal sanctuary? Southern British Columbia. 
Southern British Columbia. So Vancouver. Abbott, like suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go back to school and study your geography. <laughs> Surrey. That's uh, Surrey. Abbotsford. Surrey, uh, Langley. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, we might as well get right into this. Um, the okay, and in a way, in a way that's palatable for the audience, I think you could ask just about any American um, about the national debt, and I think it's common knowledge. Everybody's aware that as a, a government. As a nation, America is in insane amounts of debt. And I think that the general feeling about it for the average American is that we're in so much debt, it's just a big joke, and we're never going to have to pay it, and la, 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 la. Mm -hmm. But what very few Americans, I think, are aware of is that debt is a very real thing, which is going to very in a very real way rear its ugly head and and create a situation mm -hmm. and that's the situation that makes you very much favor canada as a place for me to live out my golden years oh, it's more than that steve i mean uh, canada has its debt problems as well um but you're right the uh, national debt uh recently passed 31 trillion uh, think of that, uh, the financing cost, each percentage point of interest is over 300 billion. Uh, the country's, you know, already reeling uh, with the debt. And then you've got the unfunded uh, liabilities, liabilities. Like Medicare, you know, Social Medicare, Social Security. Medicare, Social Security. Um, you've got the defense budget, which never, never quits. And so when you look at the proportion of the country's total budget, uh, the discretionary money which could be cut is a, a tiny fraction of the money that's going out. And the reason that that survives is because the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. Right. And as long as the rest of the world, uh, just about every country is struggling with its own debt problems, which makes the U.S. look less bad. But as long as the dollar remains the reserve currency, then the you know the financing will come in there will still be governments that buy american treasury bonds there will still be foreign investors that will do that and so you know it, it, it's like a, a bernie madoff ponzi scheme scheme you know it, it will go on until it doesn't go on but it, you know if you think about it it is mathematically impossible for even the existing debt ever to be repaid because um you, you can't come up with any combination of tax increases or spending cuts that would even come remotely close. So if it's never going to be repaid, and everybody knows that, when are uh, foreign institutions going to stop investing in it? And then what added burden is that going to put on the middle class who see their mortgage rates go from 6% uh, to 15% and uh, liquidity dry up and uh, everybody's so pissed off with guns all over the place they're running around taking the law into their own hands. Honestly, that may sound draconian, it may sound uh, you know, single-minded, uh, but... It's fundamentally based in fact. I, I, I believe it's fact-based, and I'd welcome an opportunity to debate anybody who uh, felt that there were facts that would go the other way. And then when I look north of the border, I say the, uh, uh, there's not the gun culture. Yes, there is debt, but it's because the Canadian dollar isn't a reserve currency, the Canadian debt is more disciplined. Uh, the Canadian political system is far less uh, fractured uh, and dysfunctional than the American political system. Right, plus the Canadian political system doesn't allow for hands to be tied so easily. You've got the... That's right. The, 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 uh, you know, the, in the parliamentary system, uh, the, the party that wins the most seats is in power, typically for four years. Between UK and Canada, there are minor differences. And if they've got a majority in the parliament for four years, they can do pretty much whatever the leader wants, recognizing that he or she knows there's going to be an election coming up. So that's the control on them to uh, 
you know, to follow the rules and do right. things the right way. In this country, if you've got, you know, all the gerrymandering that goes on where uh, congressional districts are rigged by the uh, party, you know, the party that's running the state government, um, you know, now you've got all these lawsuits that are trying to undermine the uh, credibility, the viability of the American election system. I mean, where does it all lead? And uh, when you talk about Canadian real estate being a lot more expensive than comparable U.S. real estate, yes, it is. And very frequently, something that is more expensive than something else is more expensive for a reason. <laughs> I, you know, I've said to you, uh, if you're buying something for an investment, you know, what you pay for it is a lot, lot less important than the realistic expectation of capital appreciation. All right. And that, that, that's a long-winded response, Scott, but uh, that's the <laughs> foundation of why I've been pushing Steve to think north of the border. So Vancouver. <laughs> I'm kidding. But so British Columbia, I mean, what what are your thoughts on British Columbia, Steve? Yeah, stop saying Vancouver. Right. Oh. It's like so saying, do you want to have an amateur uh, animal sanctuary in the middle of Chicago? Of course not. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> right. <laughs> Indoors. Okay. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, I've got I've got it from here. Um, I agree with what Dad's saying about the benefits of Canada, the less guns and all of that. However, part of my vision for the animal sanctuary is uh, farming, you know, a, a, a self-sustaining compound where we can grow our own food and such and just the nature of Canada being so overcast and the weather being so dismal, I think limits how much food we can grow there. That is an unfounded generality, not substantiated by facts. Well, I've done a lot of uh, uh, Zillow porn <laughs> consuming, okay? Like, you know, we, we, we go through Zillow and we yeah. call it real estate porn. And all I see that they grow there is blueberries, Dad. Well, that's because of the... Uh, international trade and the centers of excellence and the specialization but if you go back to when uh, both countries were founded you know the people lived off the land and people lived off the land in the northern parts of the u.s just as they did in canada and yes okay. it was a seasonal uh, farming business and they harvested in the fall and they saved it in their their storeroom or barn or whatever so that they could feed themselves during the winter and it was a form of discipline but if you're talking about an animal sanctuary as a business where it has to self-sustain and run itself how are you going to run a business when it's closed six months out of the year for snow well, well, for, and ice? For, first of all i think it's a pipe dream to think that that's ever going to generate enough income to sustain itself it's a charitable act that may attract some visitors but you're never going to uh, you know justify the capital investment or uh, cover the costs of running it uh, on the basis of tourist income. So my, that, thought, Canada, my thought to that, Canada. my thought to that is, is if you had in Orlando, people land not in Orlando, but in, 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 out in, of in between the two airports, Tampa and Orlando. You know how they have little pamphlets in the hotel rooms of like it's a. Yeah, yeah, do, you know, was, do you know how many tam pam different pamphlets are in those same hotel rooms? Well, right. aren't you going to open right, it if you see a Stevo Animal Sanctuary? Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I honestly think that's a loser, Scott. Uh, Orlando, <laughs> I, 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 I don't think Steve-O's Animal Sanctuary is ever going to get traction against Universal Studios and Disney and all the other businesses there. Well, yeah, it's like maybe, a, it's like maybe, a numbers game with foot traffic, yeah, right? Yeah, maybe maybe that doesn't matter. And you also didn't think that a Steve-O tour was going to go anywhere. You or know Steve what? I was never. I I shared some of your. Uh, uncertainties from the very beginning but i've been a big fan believer and supporter for at least the last 10 years okay well, what about Good. the hot sauce <laughs> <laughs> well every time i look at the p and l's I, I ask myself the same question <laughs> all right well um we, we've got some time to watch the real estate prices cool off to choose between Florida and British Columbia. And, and, and the, the other thing is, if, if, if uh, you, you share, I mean, there are a lot of Americans 
that within the U.S. are preparing for doom and gloom, and they've got their you know, cottage out in the middle of the country and their underground, all this kind of stuff. And you know, intelligent people who are maybe opinion leaders in that area, but there is a substantial concern already building here. Yeah. And uh, you know, y y you've not only got to think about how many ticket sales you're going to generalize, g generate for have come have kids come and pet these poor little animals, but <laughs> you've got to uh, figure out you know, how how are you going to support yourself? How are you going to are you going to be vulnerable? Uh, you know, if you're in the middle of Central Florida, you're not too far from a lot of large population centers that have a lot of guns and a lot of angry people. Uh. <laughs> uh, there's a lot to think about, and 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 we're we're, we're gonna we're gonna handle that. So, um, and I, I'm fascinated by the the whole take on the national debt and the future of of, of, of America. I mean, life is gonna get tough one way or yeah, another. Uh, yeah. It's just a question of when. Yeah, and 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 the other thing, politicians all over the world, but especially in this country now are famous for kicking the can down the road. Sure. And so it's going to require a Bernie Madoff kind of episode, you know, to shake the system. And by then, irreparable, I mean, it'll be even worse. But right. what politician is ever going to say, we're going to raise taxes by uh, X percent, and we're going to use those taxes to pay down the national debt, which will provide no immediate benefit that anybody is ever going to see. Right. And can you imagine the uh, commercials, the negative advertising that's going to come up, you know, when they're next up for re-election? Right. I mean, that, that's a dead loser. So I would just challenge, I mean, if somebody says America's the greatest and we'll muddle through and everything's okay, it's not possible to have, you know, a really intelligent conversation at this point. If you want to have a relative or more than relatively intelligent conversation, it's incumbent on the other side to lay out, you know, a roadmap for how we're going to get from where we are to where we're going to have a genuine soft landing. Uh, I don't yeah. see it. I, I won't be around to, uh, you know, <clears throat> suffer from it. But you will be, and I think, and uh, I just think these are important considerations. Right. Isn't that why the Fed's raising the rate, though, to control the debt or try to get it down? Uh, they're raising the, ret the rate uh, largely because they think that's going to reduce inflation. Because by raising interest rates, they're going to choke off uh, certain elements of discretionary consumption. And in the past, that's not had a direct effect totally, but yes, it has helped, you know, to cool inflation. But the other reason for raising rates is that the national debt has to be financed. And if it's not going to go into directly into a South American style printing press job, uh, treasury bonds have to be attractive to investors. And with inflation running, you know, pick a number, but real inflation uh, has got to be already north of 10%. Uh, I read somewhere that if the same formula uh, that was used when Bill Clinton was president in the early 90s, exactly the same formula were used today, the reported uh, consumer price index would be uh, 12, 13, 14%. And when investors realize that that's the effective impact of inflation, and they're getting three and three quarters percent on 10 year treasuries. How long is that party going to go on? Right. So we're screwed no matter what. And there's, you know, the, uh, the Darwinian theory, survival of the fittest. And the people that are smartest, are most resilient, and are best prepared, you know will come out better. And there are examples of countries that have collapsed and, uh, you know, re, you know, rediscovered themselves. Post, post-war Germany. Yeah. Argentina. Now, uh, Argentina maybe is a better example because post-war Germany got enormous support through the Marshall Plan. Uh, Did but, it, uh, Greece go bankrupt too? Eh, uh, it was, up I, mean, I mean, put it this way, there's a difference between formal bankruptcy and technical bankruptcy. If 
and, and Greece got bailed. Greece was such a small you know, entity that the EU decided in their great wisdom to bail them out because if the Greeks collapsed, then it would threaten the existence of the euro. Um, so, no, that, that um, the, the Greeks are not you know, necessarily a model. But, you know, there are problems all over Europe. I mean, I don't believe the uh, euro is sustainable in its current form. You've got 17 countries, each one of which has its own independently, democratically elected government that have varying degrees of uh, uh, economic sophistication and success. And you've got one central bank that is charged with establishing a monetary policy that is going to work in all of these diverse countries, all of whose governments are up for re-election every few years. Right. So if you're Germany today, then you're pulling a lot more weight than you're, you're picking up the slack of all these. Kind of yeah, I, I had that when, when the Greek crisis came. Uh, you know, there was a, this was very much in the news media. And I remember playing golf with a guy I'd never met, met before or since. He was a German living in the UK in, you know, in the financial uh, markets industry. And I asked him, you know, why does Germany keep on pouring all of its taxpayer money into countries like Greece? And he said... And Portugal and Italy yeah. and Spain. Well, and he said, because if we didn't, there'd be nobody buying our Mercedes and our BMWs. So it's kind of a revolving wheel, right. uh, recycling it. But, you know, all the stuff that's going on in, in Russia and the Ukraine, you know, is really bringing stuff to a head there. And, and that's a problem. Right. Um, you, you described the problems with the EU. Uh, the UK, after Brexit, like that, in, 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 in hindsight, Brexit was a mistake. Can we say that? I don't agree with that. Uh, most people in the UK do. Um, I, I guess I'd put a different spin on it. Um, when the UK was a member of the EU, uh, they were required to contribute large amounts of money uh, to the common cause. Uh, the countries were called upon to contribute in relationship to the strength of their economies. And it was a political issue that a lot of taxpayer money uh, from the UK was going into Europe. Um, I struggled with Brexit when it um, you know, was in debate. Because and at the time you were living in England. Uh, no, I, I, I guess I, I, I think I, I, uh, I think we just I just stopped living in England, but I was awfully close to England. I watched the UK news every day and and, and all the rest of it. And uh, my view then, and is still my view, is that there would be a significant short-term pain. Short-term meaning five, six, eight years, uh, because of the change in the in the trade patterns. That that would be pain to go through. I said there would be, in my opinion, a long-range benefit because I honestly believe it is a mathematical certainty that the euro is going to collapse because of the political conflicts and because of the debts and without getting into a lot of, a lot of detail. That's going to be a train wreck. And if the UK was still a member of the EU being called upon to make annual contributions to uh, you know help solve the financial problems of the EU, the potential for that to grow is enormous. So to me, it was a rare case where short-term prosperity was sacrificed for a longer-term benefit. All right, I buy that, and I, I, I can digest that. Um, you're, you're a smart guy, Dad. There, there's, there's no question about that. And uh, I'm grateful for you on, on every level. And, uh, and, and I love you so much, and thank you for doing this. You're very, very welcome. And uh, I not only love being with you and having these conversations, but I feel really good when I kick your ass when you need it. Good. <laughs> good. <laughs> Do you love my dad or do you love my dad? I mean, dude. Now, I'm going to share something that I probably shouldn't, but I love the street team, the people who stick around to the very end of the podcast. Sometimes you get the juicy nugs of 
of info. Now, this is what it is. Um, somebody reached out to us, to my team, about they want to make a documentary about Steve-O. Now, the first thing I thought is that the world's hardly hurting for yet another documentary about Steve-O. But I thought it was meaningful that they reached out to me before finishing the documentary and making it public like some other people. And I thought, you know what? Let me talk to him. So I talked to him. And um, I was impressed by the, by the, the, the guy. I was impressed by his company. And, 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 and I figured that a documentary about Steve-O the businessman and Steve-O and his relationship with his dad. I told this guy, my dad says he's got tops 10 years of useful life left. And before that 10 years or before his life is over, he wants me to be prepared to... Dude, it's just so rad. So I want to make a documentary about me and my dad, and I think I made a deal with the guy to do it. <laughs> Love you guys. <laughs> that was a juicy nugget, bro. Yeah.